Welcome back, everybody, to the You Ask, We Podcast, the show where you ask the questions, they answer, and I'm just the guy in the middle. We're back for season two, and we're back with a banger, ladies and gentlemen. He is the co-founder of Next Gen Z with rapper Lil Durk, and it's a digital and physical sneaker company. They were both interviewed on the Full Send Nelk Boys podcast about the sneaker, which received close to 4 million views. Uh, ben, he also has experience creating an NFT prototype for Nicki Minaj for Crypto.com. Um, he's worked with Gary Payton. He's worked with Nicki Haskell. He's worked with a bunch of really cool people. And he runs his own podcast called Legends Leaders, where he, he interviews CEOs pretty much every other week. So I want to give a warm welcome to my man, Ben Weiss. Ben, what's up? How you doing? Doing good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. So pretty much the way the show works is the first question always comes from me. And that's, you know, what's new? What's going on with you? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, we're, tr we're trying to do something different in the world. I think that that's super important um, to, to try to be innovative. I think there's a lot of different people that want to be entrepreneurs and want to create something. And, you know, we're just trying to have our part to be to do something, and have a positive impact with it. So it's continuing on that path. Yeah, man, that's amazing. And I love to hear that from you. You know, that's great. So pretty much before we get into all this NFT stuff, you know, um, this is a question from Jacob my, from Miami. And I got to admit, it's a little bit for myself, too. How exactly, you know, do NFT work? Because I'm still kind of confused by it at this point. Yeah, it's a good question. And so it's, I mean, NFTs are very unique and it's kind of funny. There's so much like ambiguity around them because it's not that complicated. Just the uses of them may be a little bit difficult to discern. Um, it really is just, it's a digital collectible. So just like you would go out and buy a pack of cards and, you know, maybe they have Pokemon on them or your favorite sports players, et cetera. Um, some of them are rarer than other ones that are issued by the company. And, you know, there's a limited amount of them. And you have this authenticity to it because it's issued by Tops, it's issued by the Pokemon company. And the same thing is like that for NFTs. So an NFT is a digital card, a digital collectible that's issued by somebody and there's a finite amount of them made. And it has value because it's, it's it's connected to the original person that created them. And it's, uh, there's only a certain amount of them created. So it's just like that, but it's for it's like digital collectibles. Um, basically, it's the same kind of thing like cards, but but digitally. Got you. Okay, so yeah, that sounds cool. Um, so based yeah. on all that knowledge, pretty much, uh, this is a question from Robert from LA. Um, where would you like personally, in your in your own opinion, where would you see NFTs looking like long term? Yeah, so it's a good question because like this whole industry right now is is a very it's in a very unique place. You know, there's there's so much excitement from everybody who's everybody, every brand, every celebrity, every every person to kind of just get involved in this space. And you know, there's been some certain unfortunate um, scams, and there's been other things that have happened in the space that have been less than ideal. Um, so it's now it's kind of finding its own ground. And this is like kind of how the crypto is was early on. This is how the internet was early on. You, know, you got companies that were completely fake, like Enron, for example, with the early internet. And it's not like people just gave up on the internet. And, you know, like they came back to it. They said, hey, there's a lot of potential here. Um, and people built upon that. So that's kind of where the NFT space is. I think, I think the problem is right now is that there is this lack of like, there's a lack of like real world application in this space. So like something that you can use on an everyday basis that's powered by NFT, that's powered by blockchain. You know, the closest thing that's right now out there is like Coinbase. So if you're curious enough to buy a cryptocurrency you've heard about and you think, oh, this could be a good investment, you can go out there and buy it on the Coinbase um, app. So, you know, there needs to be something that's like, you know, as important to your daily life as the internet, as going on Google and searching it, searching something up, as watching a video on YouTube. But there, there needs to be that kind of consumer importance um, or at least something that kind of gets to that point, as well as the tools, the accessibility provided there. It's not necessarily simple enough to go and purchase an NFT to you need to buy cryptocurrency. You need to be able to have a cryptocurrency wallet. You need to have another app called Token Proof to even go and, and use it, just like you'd use a ticket to go to an event or utility that comes with that digital collectible. Um, so those tools also need to be implemented. And there needs to be real world value provided for the average person for it to actually scale. Or right, got it. So Basically, long story short, you would say there's a bit of a way to go for it to be a mainstream thing. You know, there is a bit of a way to go, but that's like the exciting point of it. Because look, if something's hot, then everybody's kind of in on it. And there's only so much room to go from there, right? But if right. you're at a point where there's something really new, 
and there's already shown to be a ton of interest in this space from from so many people then there's this opportunity to bridge that gap between the interest and the and the usability um and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of potential of, of money to be made and and uh, and an impact on people's lives too so that's kind of like the exciting point of it. it's more like some people get deterred from that they're like oh man like this is what this is where we're at right now you know people aren't using this they were using it then you know now there's only a little bit a lot less interest i think that that's where like the exciting point comes in it's like okay let's build right now like let's let's build something on top of this yeah i mean so i i guess i guess you could say it kind of feels like bitcoin like when we were in high school like the 20 like yeah 2017 like years yeah back then it's like it was still like kind of like a small thing like no one really knew about it but people were making bank like it was yeah i mean yeah. I, I found out about bitcoin like um somebody told me about it in high school i think i was like 16 at the time like oh there's this thing called bitcoin it's this digital currency i was like all right well i can just send money to my bank account like why is this so interesting i went on the website i didn't really know how to buy it you know and then like all of a sudden later on i was in israel for a year um, and then somebody else kept in my dorm room kept buying it and buying into this stuff. And I'm like, all right, take some of my money, just buy into this. You know, you've convinced me enough. And then the kind of the it just escalated from there. Like, oh, this stuff is actually kind of interesting. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, it started from somewhere. You know, that's great. And for sure. Honestly, it's like pretty much. I feel like that's just how all life is in general. Because there's a saying um, that I've heard for a while, and I kind of live by. If you heard about it, it's too late. Hmm. Interesting. So, you know, it's like things that are like new. It's like they tend to be on the rise, like, and you're waiting for like everyone else to find out pretty much. But well, it's like trends, you know, like you got to be the one that really makes the trends if yeah. you want to be able to capitalize on that. Otherwise, if you're following the trends, like, how are you going to make money on that? Like, how are you going to become make? I mean, how are you going to get to the point where you become make, can make a billion dollars from it or more than that? You know, that only can really happen from you shaping the trends and being even at the forefront of it, an early adopter, which is something that's, you know, harder to do generally than what the rest of the people have, but it, and it can fail. You know, there's in many cases where you won't make anything from that, but you have a shot, a much bigger shot from that point on being in early than maybe later on. Yeah. And honestly, speaking of, um, going with the trends and pretty much trying to make things unique and stuff like that. This question comes uh, from Michael from LA. So you basically, you run an NFT sneaker company with Lil Dirk. So he's actually curious, what makes the sneakers special? Yeah. So, um, you know, kind of the idea I had originally was like, take this physical product that people understand they know they love this footwear product and also combine it with something new and innovative and different this digital collectible this nft and put them together so there's not like this kind of confusion around it um so part of the that was like the original idea and it's we developed and designed a physical shoe it's a luxury sneaker it's, uh we've been producing prototypes already in portugal um and it's a shoe that and shoot the jerk got to really put his own creative spin into it. So something that's fully hit entirely his own, which is kind of unprecedented for him in a sense. Um, and then the NFT portion of it is something that can provide early access to his upcoming releases. Um, it's a pass that can be integrated to Web3 games. So there's certain types of, of crypto games that you can wear the shoe in. That's kind of like the overall plan down the line. Uh, but an early access pass. I mean, if you had an early access pass to releases coming out of Supreme or coming out of Bape or brands like that, and you own that pass and you could get priority access to it. I mean, there's substantial value for something like that. Um, so that's kind of like the direction of where we've been trying to go with it. And then there's this community formed around this uh, this sneaker um, and what we're building with him, uh, with this next gen's brand. Um, that's something that uh, is you really, you, know, you have the unprecedented access with this digital collectible, with the understanding of what's there. That's kind of like the overall goal of what we want to be able to deliver on. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's really awesome. That's really great. And I'm, I'm rooting for this to take off, you know, like, I mean, even though it, it kind of already has, I'm, I'm rooting for it all the way. It's really awesome. Appreciate it. And kind of speaking on that, um, this is a question from Mikey from Brooklyn. How, how are you able to collab with Lil Dirk in the first place? How'd you get that? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's not like, look, you know, you have to be able to hustle. You have to be able to envision something and go after it and go after it and believe in yourself. Like, I don't know how, like, self-belief is taught by your parents sometimes. Sometimes people just have it. Um, but it's something that's really important. Like, step one is got to believe. And then step two is you have to act on those beliefs in a, in a, in a realistic, calculated way. So basically, the way it happened is um, somebody told me, somebody, it's kind of like a lot, to make a long story short, um, 
I was interested, actually interested in the electronic, the electric car space. I think there's a lot of opportunity in the EV space to make a mass market affordable vehicle. So I graduated college, right? Went to YU and, um, and thought, okay, you know, I'm going to go into this space and really build something that's an affordable, like a Toyota Corolla, but actually cool, nice, nice car. You know, Toyota Corolla fits its market, but like a nice kind of cool car, sporty in a sense, um, that, that like kind of has that type, that type of price point, um, and affordable. Um, not knocking on Toyota Corolla by any means there. Um, so I was going to go and build something like that. And I thought to myself, okay, how am I going to go and get into this space and figure it out? So it happened to be my dad had a friend who was in the car space who helped bring Subaru to the United States and became successful off of that. Um, so I met, met with him at an event and um, kind of through him, I found out more about the car space and wound up going to another event in the car space. And through there, subsequently, I met this guy who was well-connected and, and built a relationship with him. Um, and, and then he's like, he was kind of like, oh, you know, have you heard of this guy, Moishimata? I was like, who's Moishimata? He's like, well, he got in Miami early on in real estate and built up Winwood Miami, some of these most popular spots in Miami. He's like, you know, he's throwing a free birthday party that anyone can go to. There's going to be thousands of people there. You can get an Eventbrite invitation. You can just show up to it. I mean, there's going to be VIP sections, so you may not be able to get into those, but you can kind of go to this event. But he's like, maybe I can get you into the VIP sections. You know, I'll, I'll try my best. And I just graduated college was like, you know, okay, I'll just do this. I'll have some fun at this party. Maybe I'll meet some good people. You know, networking is important. Uh, it can be very beneficial. So I showed up at this party. I dressed in a suit with like a bow tie, like really looking good at it, you know, trying to, um, trying to put the best, uh, the best kind of, uh, best version of me out there. And, um, you know, went to this event and I, I didn't even see this person who told me to go there for like an hour, hour and a half. Like I'm just waiting for, I'm kind of like frustrated. Like, where is this guy? Like you just told me to show up. I just drove like an over an hour to get here. This thing is going, it's crazy. I couldn't even get parking for it. And eventually he says, yo, Hey, how you doing? Um, and you know, here, you know, let's try to get you into this VIP section. And there's three different sections. So one of the sections I go to the VIP, I go to the VIP and he gets me into it and I'm hanging out there. I'm just trying to meet people, connect with people, get people's contact information, et cetera. You know, say, Hey, I'm Ben. I just, I, I wasn't even saying like, I just graduated. I'm doing this in the NFT space over here. I'm, I'm creating this type of, you know, here, I guess I just sold them on my, on my vision of what I want to do. I didn't really have so much to sell them on yet. I sold them on the vision and I got some people's contact info and stuff, but it really wasn't necessarily what I was looking for yet. But I was like, okay, these are interesting kind of people. So what left that VIP section, and then he got me into the next one. So I went to the next VIP section and met some other interesting people. Meanwhile, my whole goal of this event was I was going to talk to Moishimana. I wanted to get to Moishimana and speak with him and talk to him about um, creating, you know, something maybe in the smart home space. I had some di different ideas. I was still trying to figure out the idea at the time. And I, you know, I kind of, I, I was like, I went to these sections this was hours of time, you know, spending in the, like over an hour of time. I got in your network and you're moving around. You're not just like partying. Like it, it was, it was, it takes a toll on you. So I was kind of at the point where I was there at this party for three hours and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to head back. I didn't go to the last VIP section. So I'm like, okay. Um, I'm like, all right, I'm just going to kind of head out. You know, that's enough. So I'm literally about to walk out. Like, this is like the stage. Like, let's just say this is where the last VIP section ends. Like, I'm about to get to the point where you, I'm, I'm out of that area. You can't even see the stage anymore. And I'm past it. And I'm like out. Like, no one would even be able to stop me if they could. And I, by the way, I was like thinking in my head at that time, like, like, I don't know if I should like even do this. I'm exhausted. But I'm like, who gets to go to this VIP section, this party? I'm like, I'm just going to just really split second decision. It's and then theory. went into the yeah, just that right that second went into that VIP section. Um, and then got, uh, you know, I basically through there, I got bouncer let me in in the past. He's introduced me to this guy, um, Brian, who, uh, who is well connected in the hip hop space. And we start talking, he's like, take my number, call me in two days, I'm gonna help you get we're gonna help get in touch with somebody in the hip hop space. And I got all these connections in that area, we're gonna make it happen. And, and through him, uh, through working with him, we got to Dirk and it's a, you know, we had to pitch him. It's a whole process there, but that's kind of how, how it happened. Yeah. But that That's a crazy story. That's, that's really yeah. insane. like, it was all over the place. And then like you, you like were able to like get to what you wanted to get to. So it's like, that's really awesome. So this is a question from Johnny speaking of the whole networking thing. Like, like obviously the hustle is important. And you have to have that mentality throughout. But Johnny from Great Neck is curious, like when you network, like, is there something specific that you think you say or do that makes you so captivating? Well, I think it's about, there's a lot of things to go into. I think it's presentation. I think you need to look good. You, you know, you need to wear a nice shirt, you need to have 
you know, nice pants on, shoes, et cetera. You need to talk well. You need to know what you're talking about. If you're going to go and you have a specific intention of meeting somebody, you need to research them before. You need to understand who they are. And you need to also, in your mind, have a clear objective of what you want to talk with them about. You know, you don't want to waste somebody's time. If they're an important person, if they're a successful individual, an interesting individual, or even just somebody in general that you want to talk to and think is a good connection, you need to research them, be aware of the objective, and specifically have an end way to close that objective out with them. And um, because you only get so much time to do that and they don't necessarily even know you. So that you have to make their them want to talk to you even in the beginning. So it's very much a logical process there. Um, You also need to put yourself in the right place at the right time. Sometimes it's not always so easy to do that. You need to put work into finding the right event if you want to talk to this individual or go and reach out to them online if you want to talk to that individual. You know, you need to be able to be sophisticated about how you do it. It's not just like, oh, it's kind of just happens. Like it, sometimes maybe it does, but if you're in the right place in the right time, that can happen. You know, there, there is an element of luck to that, but you need to be able to put the work in to make that happen and, and have a clear goal to do so. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And it really does like kind of all depend like on what event you go to too. I actually have a story one time uh like this was with um like i got an email through the sports lawyers association and they sent an email basically saying there's like a job fair at angel stadium in Anaheim, huh. right so i'm thinking oh this is a great opportunity you know because i'm trying to go into sports law personally this is a great opportunity i'm gonna go there network see what's up right and i go every single job is sales and marketing so huh. Completely not I want not what I wanted at all. But you know, I still made the best out of it. I was still able to schmooze around and stuff like that. Right. So I kind of like have some people that I know from that event. So I'm thankful for that. But yeah, I mean the place you're going to is the most important thing. You need to know where you're going. You know? Yeah, you definitely need to be smart. Like, you know, like what you mentioned there, like you gotta be smart about where you are. Like sometimes if it's not working out one way, there's other opportunities, but because there's certain people there you can get you can talk with and you know and and build relationships with them, etc. Like you have to be able to think quick and and be sophisticated about it. Maybe like sometimes you're being led in a different direction and you gotta take advantage of that. Like like your story there. Yeah, pretty much exactly. So yeah, and you know, from all that networking, you were able to get one of your biggest business partners, Lil Dirk, and mm-hmm. you guys ended up going on the Full Send podcast. So Mitch is really curious, like Mitch from LA, he's really curious as to what was that like? Yeah, you know, it's an incredible experience. Um, it's definitely something that I was fortunate to have. Um, and, you know, the Nelk boys are great, you know, really great guys. That Their whole team was so nice to us. Um mm-hmm. And I mean, that experience was, you know, it was, it was the first podcast I've ever done, by the way, um, that I've ever been interviewed on. And you got to just, it, it kind of started where it was like, oh, I don't know if I'm necessarily going to go on and talk about it. And, um, you know, and then eventually it made sense for me to go on to the, the podcast. And you kind of just, I just hopped in, you know, I had to really talk about what we were doing and do it in a way that uh, makes sense and, you know, makes, makes little Dirk look good and makes what we're creating look good and, and the entire team's efforts. Um and, you know, and I think that there's something different about what we we're doing. So that, you know, definitely provides a lot of confidence to talk about something like that because, um, you know, it's his first shoe. It's something that's unique for him and something that he's put some time into and, and put his creative vision into. And there's meaning behind something like that. And um, I want to just really make those things kind of kind of show. Um, but it was, uh, it was you know, it was a unique experience. And I've, I've kept a good relationship, you know, with the Nelk boys. I like them. They're great guys. They've been super nice to me since then. And, uh, and I think that, um, I think it's something that's really helped us get our message out there. And uh, it's, yeah, it's got close to 4 million views now and, and counting. And uh, it provided a whole unique side of Dirk that I think many people haven't seen, um, which was very more, very much conversational about some, I think, interesting things in culture that were going on at the time and his music. I mean, even when we released it, I think he had the top, like, like the top 15, all top 15 songs on Apple Music at the time with the 7220 album just coming out. Um, and it's, I mean, I still see clips on YouTube from there because of the unique angle provided. Um, so I think it did a lot for him. It was like one of his like second or third most watched podcasts of, um, in the entirety of his career. Uh, so it was something that was really great for him too. Um, not just only for the next gen's project. Yeah. So it, it was really cool. And I gotta say, um, first of all, the full send podcast being your first ever podcast is an amazing thing for you. And I also like, when I watched that clip of you on the podcast and I saw you talking, I did not believe it was your first one because you were, you carried yourself with such professionalism. Like you, it felt like you were PR trained. Like, 
<laughs> yeah, appreciate that. I mean, you gotta, you know, you need to be able to show up at things like that. Um, and, and do, you know, cause when I'm talking, it's not just about me, you know, it's about the team. It's about the people there. It's about the work we put into it. It's about our investor, you know, and you want to really be able to represent that in, in the best way that's focusing on we and all of us there. Um, so I think that, you know, I've also, I, in high school, I ran the public speaking club. I created a public speaking club in high school. We brought in Toastmasters, which is well known for educating people on public speaking. Um, and I, I've sp spoken to, I think, like eight different crypto conferences in the last like year and a half, two years or so, including internationally, one in London, you know, most of which uh, I think I think most of which happened after one of them before. Um, but it's really great to be able to communicate your message and what you have to what you have to say and, and do it in a, in a sophisticated and strong way. You can really impact people and you can have. Um, do something that can inspire a lot of people and get people interested in what you're building. And if I'm, you know, we're putting a lot of work into something like that, it's really important to communicate that effectively. Yeah, no, it's really awesome. And, um, you know, speaking of impacting people, um, this question comes from Yoel from Toronto, because speaking of impacting people, you run your own podcast called Legends and Leaders, and you pretty much um, interview CEOs every other week for like different businesses and stuff like that. And I feel like it impacts a lot of people because they're all able to learn, you know, how to become better for themselves by learning from some of the best to do it. So this question is from Yoel from Toronto. What would you say you find as a common trait in all these successful people? That you uh, it's like, that's like the money question. That's the best question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I, the goal of legends and leaders is to really break down how successful and interesting people, people that fit into the leaders and legends category have done what they've done. There was a lot of really interesting stories that are out there. And, but what you see kind of a lot in the media and things is like pieces of people's stories, you know, one part of how they accomplish one aspect, but you know, everyone has their own journey and there's a lot of people who want to be like these people and to see the full journey and how they literally went from as a kid, where the passion developed all the way over to like building this business, raising the funding for it, meeting the right people, how the idea came about, you know, to understand that, it can do so many wonders for you in terms of what you're trying to build. And we've had a lot of people in various different categories break that down. I think the biggest thing is like, I think the biggest thing is really, you know, not giving up. Um, some of these people like have had to go through a, very, a difficult period of time to really get to the point where their business had some sort of success. Um, and it's just not something that's so public. You know, for example, uh, Chris Barton, who founded Shazam, the Shazam music recognition app. You know, he founded, I think he founded it uh, I was like 10 plus years before the iPhone even came out. So you used to call up a phone, a traditional phone. You would call up a, a number on the phone and you'd play the music by that number. And they would tell you what the song is before the app even came out. And he was like struggling to get by. I think, I think he was struggling to get by a bit, um, you know, during that period of time. And then when the iPhone came out, he really took advantage of that without much marketing and word of mouth and, and Shazam spread. Um, and then eventually got acquired for $400 million dollars. Um, and you know, something it was, there's similar elements of that story as well. Um, with a couple other ones, I got, you know, there was, uh, like, um, for example, Adam Chire, who's the inventor of Siri, um, you know, he created, you know, the Siri, Siri, he had the idea for Siri much further before the, the iPhone came out. He was originally doing it where we transcribe like words on a pad. Um, and it was, uh, and kind of tell you, and you had to kind of work like that with that type of interface. Like, I think he even was doing it when there was floppy disks around, which I'm not sure even how familiar you are with floppy disks, like very early on. I don't know, like ish. You know. Yeah, it's, it's an, you know, early, like I never had to really use them at all. Um, so it's like, like that early on, and it kind of just had the idea, and it was years and years later, and even the acquisition of Siri. He said, Steve Jobs, he, he told Jobs, no, he said, I don't want to do this acquisition. And Jobs just kept calling, kept calling, kept calling, you know, and was persistent with him. And eventually it happened. Um, and it's something that, you know, I mean, if some people give up with an idea after maybe a couple of days or a couple of months. I mean, these are people that went on with some of the biggest and most impactful ideas of this generation went on for maybe 10, 15 years before really anything even happened of like, of like the traction, like even like more minor traction, but they believed in these ideas so much. Um, so, you know, and they kept going. So it's really about keep going, never giving up. You got to be persistent. You got to believe in yourself. You have to keep making progress, consistent progress, you know, and just keep putting one foot in front of the other one in front of the other one. And you got to be sophisticated about the idea. It's got to make sense. Um, but I think it's that belief in that, and that aspect of never giving up, giving up that really gets you in there. And what's, um, similar between many of these people. So when you interview these people on your podcast, like, I'm actually kind of curious, did you know these people prior or 
did you like network more to get these people to come on the show? And if so, like, yeah, how did that transpire. It's a it's a mix. Um, some of the people I know prior, some of them I reach out to for it. I think I think you got to just try to find the best way to reach out to somebody and and really put you know write the best type of message to them. You know, tell them what it would mean to you to be able to talk with them. Um, you know, tell them the importance of that. Tell them you know why you want to be able to speak with them and. I think that that I think that people are very much. There's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of people that have, really want to share what they've done. Um, they have a great voice, and um, and I think that if you can find the best way and not give up, maybe try multiple ways and um, to get to people like that, to get to interesting people, um, it's something that is entirely possible for you to do and can really impact your life and, and impact others. I mean, with the Legends of Leaders, it's it's a great mission. You know, it's a mission to really help democratize this knowledge. You know, um, some of these individuals, the knowledge they have hasn't necessarily been out there. And it hasn't necessarily been been as exposed. And to be able to have them give back and do it in a way for other people, um, you know, that people can click on for free in a sense on YouTube or Spotify. Um, it's something that they want to be able to do, and something that they feel like is um, is quite some is quite important to them. And so having that kind of this what we're building play into that too, I think, is another factor as well. Yeah, I really love that. That's awesome. Um... Honestly, and I gotta ask because this question is burning in my mind. When you were on the Full Send podcast, what was what was the set like? I have to know. Oh, it was a unique experience. Um, basically, it was like a, it was a boat. It was like a yacht, um, in behind somebody's house in Miami, uh, and we took a small boat to get to the bigger boat. And wow. well, the big it was like, yeah, it was on the back of a bigger boat, and it was like fifteen people, just a couple people on a couch on the boat in the back with like two or three different cameras, and then like. Um, like 15 people just kind of standing around behind the cameras and, and like we shot it, you know, kind of right there. It was just one take. Uh, I'll probably shot like an hour and a half of footage, hour and 45 minutes of footage put out. They put out about an hour of that. Um, I hopped in and out a couple of times. I think one of the times made the cut. The other time didn't make the cut. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a, they have a good setup. I think that they, they figured out a really good podcasting setup overall. They have a bunch of different angles and yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, when when you have a budget, like, it just makes everything so much easier, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, I think that there's also like the way that they that Kyle and um, at the time it was Kyle, Bob, um, Salim, like the way they hold, they held themselves is like they, they they communicate in a very friendly, open minded way. So it wasn't like okay, hey, we're starting. That's that. It was just everyone was talking, and Dirk was like, oh. Did we start yet? You know, but like it kind of the conversation was already going. They got everyone into it easy. And I like think that's like the flows into it pretty much. Right. So it's yeah. a good, it's a, it can be a good style for what you're, they're trying to do for sure. Yeah, no, it's like, they, they definitely seem like really chill people. Like I, I bet off camera, they're just as chill, if not more. So. Oh yeah. They're also, they're, they're pretty smart guys. Like, like they're very sophisticated about social media and about, and, and they're disciplined about it. And they, I mean, I mean, we did this podcast at, and it was, I think it, the podcast happened at, must have been like a, a like 11 p.m., you know, and we shot it, and we must have shot it from like 10.30 to like 11.45 p.m., you know, like these guys were, were going at it, like they're shooting this podcast at almost midnight, you know, so there's, there's a, there's a work ethic that they have that's pretty good, and, um, and they're very sophisticated about that. Awesome. Yeah, so, so pretty much the way the show works is... I ask the first question and I also always ask the last question. And the last question is if you could leave the viewers with one piece of advice, what would you tell them? Yeah, I would say, look, if you have, if you have somewhere you want to go in life and some place that you want to be at, you need to have a clear vision in your mind. That's simple, not too complicated and have an idea of the steps to get you there. And you need to be able to start acting on each one of them. You know, for me, like I, I feel happier when I'm going in this direction of, of wanting to achieve something. And I have it in my what my goal is, and I have what I want to do daily. I make it daily to be able to get to that goal. I think that that's something that you know you need to be able to structure it because getting to a certain level, it's not just by chance. It's by work ethic. It's by persistence. It's by your, your smarts and maybe some luck too at times. Um, but, you know, it's always debatable. But you got to be able to you got to be able to, to actualize that potential. And I think that for anybody who, in any, in it's any type of field for anyone who wants to get to some, some sort of place, you got to just, you got to structure it and make it realistic for yourself to be able to do that. Um, because, you know, there's nobody else limiting you, but yourself, you have to free yourself from those types of limitations. You have to have that self-belief. It's, it's only up to you 
and for, for what you, you know, you're the only one who has that dream in your mind. And it's up to you to be able to get that if you choose to do so. And the, the life that you're going to have it's going to be, it's dependent on that. You know, I've met so many different interesting and unique people. I've been exposed to new types of ideas. I've experienced different events. I've, tr I've spoken internationally. I've had all these unique experiences because I've put the most amount of work in, you know, I try to put the most amount of work into myself possible and want to do something positive for the world with that. And I think that if you kind of pursue it in a structured way like that, you can really have something, do something that's quite exciting for yourself and have quite an exciting life. Absolutely beautiful. Ben, Thank you so much for coming on. If you guys like this episode, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're interested in what Ben's got going on, I highly, highly suggest checking out the links down below. I'm going to share his stuff and all that. Um, if you're interested in what's going on with the show and you want to follow up, you want to ask questions for the next guests, make sure to follow the socials. All the links are going to be down below. Thank you all so much for watching. This has been Ben Weiss. My name's Ed in Toronto. And I'll see you guys next week. Yeah. Up. <laughs>